With the recent release of their latest effort, Blush, Mexico City Blondes have gone from aspiring musicians to indie stardom. At the time of this recording, Blush has landed on the 26th spot on the NACC charts, being scrunched in with artists such as Lizzo and Mac DeMarco. Certainly not bad for a duo that linked up through a Craigslist ad. While they have continued to expand their sound, they continue to push the boundaries within their own respective field. On WZMB interviews, we talk to Mexico City Blondes about their latest effort, origins, musical influences, and much more. All right, so Mexico City Blondes, and I just want to say congrats on the new album, Blush. It was released uh, May 3rd, 2019, right? Yeah. All right, and I just want to talk to you guys about uh, your new album. And some of my questions are, like, was were there any pressures to, like, live up to? Because I know for a while you guys had the single fade, right, back in 2014? And were you guys ever, like, constantly compared to, like, that track by itself? Oh, yeah, man, for sure. Yeah, it was, it was uh, you know, when, when we put the first record out and we dropped the first single, we didn't honestly expect that anybody really outside of our friends and family would probably hear it. It's kind of how it goes in music. It's tough. It's tough to make uh, an impression. There's just so much great music that comes out on a daily basis, and no one really knew who who we were. And then when that track took off, it, it was it was it was wild. But then yeah, it was it was hard because you're kind of looking around. We had a record, um, you know, we had a couple other songs, but were they were all a little different. So it was sort of like, yeah, I don't know, do we have another fade? Do we want to do that? Like, should we just? keep trying to make songs like that if people like it or should we just you know put out the stuff we want to do and ultimately we just decided that we'd be better off not getting in too much in our own heads although we did for a little while and just trying to record and release the music that we wanted to and not not try and anticipate what we thought people would want to hear and what did you think about it ali like were do you think like that you guys were going to be like like trapped in a cycle of being compared to fade like you know how like some bands are compared to like their first project so radiohead like in their beginning years were compared to like the creep song everyone always like compared them to that or no one ever listens to joy divisions uh closer their second album or people always compare franz ferdinand to take me out instead of their other projects so sure. what did you think about it ali sure well you know uh I, I do love the style that Fade is in. I like the under the kind of like underproduced quality of it. And so I, you know, I wouldn't be opposed to making music like that, you know, for a long time. But I do think that when you go into it, when you go into the process of songwriting, thinking like, oh, I'm going to write a song like that, it never works. You, you just have to let it kind of happen organically. And you, I, whenever I write songs, I just kind of know if it's going to if it's gonna work, you know, when I went in the moment when I know. So it's kind of impossible to, to try to, you just freeze. If, you, if Personally, I just freeze if I try to write a song like that. So it was, yeah, it was, I don't have any problem with uh, being, it's a great song, it fades, fades awesome. And it's 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 a chill, chill groove. So I think uh, we're not trying to not make that again, but uh, but not definitely just trying to be more organic about it. And, it's de- and I definitely wanna say that it's helped you guys in your favors because you guys are pretty close to a million streams on Spotify. Like, think of how many uh, indie bands, like, when starting, like, just dream of making it past a thousand streams. So, yeah, that, I mean, it's, it's, definitely, that, yeah it's definitely worked out for you guys a lot. And, and what was cool about that was, like, we didn't have a label. We didn't have any PR. And we, that, that song, that never, it never got any kind of marketing push. It all got to those places just because people liked it and kept listening to it and shared it. So it was, it, it was really gratifying because it felt really organic. It didn't feel like there was anything sort of forced about it. It just, we had the good fortune to like connect with a lot of people through that song. And like Ali said, we're proud of it. We really like the song. I think it's, it's uh, something that I'm so proud of all these years later. It's not something that we try and kind of run from. We just sort of continue to do, the music that we want and some of it sounds a little like that and some of it doesn't and we hope people you know that like that song like the new stuff too but you, you don't really have any control over that just another question about uh, your album and you guys are on burger records obviously at this point right yeah so was there any really uh any pressure to like release it within you know the two-year span that you constantly see in the music industry uh, well, we we actually didn't even sign the burger until we had the record done. Really? Yeah. So we we Allie and I just did it all on our own, and then um, our manager, 
uh, knew Sean and Lee. And uh, once we finished it, we said, well, you know, I, I like recording a lot and Ali and I like writing. We're not as we're not great on the hustle and the promotion side of things. We sort of decided that for this time around, it would be nice to have a partner and someone to help us kind of put it out and get it out there. And uh, we always really like Gregor Records. And um, I, I honestly, I was kind of I didn't necessarily think it would be up their alley just because they're associated more with kind of like a garage rock sort of more lo-fi kind of vibe. Um, but uh, our manager sent it over to him. They, they just loved the record and they were like, we want to absolutely want to put this out. So we, we said, all right. So that's cool. So, yeah, we didn't really have a lot of pressure um, because we were just working on our own time. It wasn't like we had a, a label kind of banging down our door being like, oh, we need the record by, you know, <laughs> next month or, or this or that. We put a, a lot of pressure on ourselves. But it was something that it's just like it's not done until it's done and you can't really rush a lot of these things particularly like the songwriting if it's just not clicking you got to come back to it a question about uh, your style and obviously you know when you're uh you're first starting up as a band like you're trying to emulate the artists that you were most influenced by and ali specifically with you when i hear like tracks like fade or out to dry like you know etc I get a Beth Gibbons kind of vibe, like from Portishead. Yeah. So I don't know, if, were you trying to go for this? Like, were you trying to go in that like trip hop jazz kind of like Absolutely. Direction? Yeah, we, we were. When Greg and I met, we were virtual strangers to talk about, you know, our first track, making our first record together. And those were some of the names that did come up, um, you know, Massive Attack in addition. And at the time I was really into um, Phanagram and just really like a, like a stripped down, like do like very few musicians, you know, just a duo kind of vibe. And uh, definitely I think we... I, what I love about those bands is they give themselves permission to be mellow. Like they're not trying to create some dance pop hit, you know, like, like not everybody's ears are going to want that. But I, I just appreciate that, that um, the space that those bands have created for a moodier, moodier kind of track. Yeah. And I definitely feel that because when I listen to like your tracks and especially blush, I get very like atmospheric, like, you know, lush production. And I'm reminded of either like, of Beach House or like Portis Head's like second album, uh, the self-titled album. So I'm like very reminded of like very spaced out like textures and production. So were you guys like going for this on the second record? Absolutely. Those were those are bands that were like I mean honored to be even in the same sentence or conversation about you know with because those are great bands. But absolutely, we we always love to strive for that kind of vibe. And it, you, I, I always appreciated in, in a group like Portis had the, the textures in, in the production. They used a lot of samples. Everything was kind of gritty. There was a lot of air. You know, there's just sort of a grit and a crackle to those tracks and a lot of space that is really kind of, you know, intoxicating, I think. So, and and something like, yeah, that second Portis had record was, was big for me, for sure. I mean, that track, All Mine, you know, when you yes. listen to a, a song like Audio and you hear those horns on the pre-chorus, that's kind of, you know, trying to get that, that vibe, that big kind of lush horn sound. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all in there. We've got a lot of influences, but that's where Allie and I kind of overlap because she has a really kind of you know, uh, gorgeous sort of smoky voice. And then, um, you know, the production that suits her voice is very often in that kind of, kind of vein. Um, and you really, with, with Allie's voice, you sort of, you can't get a really dense production because you don't want to compete with it too much. There's a lot of beauty and subtlety in it. So it, you kind of strip out the middle a little bit and you have a lot of bass and the drums can be really loud and you can have things kind of twinkling around it, but you ultimately want to anchor it with her you know, vocal, and then you can sort of figure out what you can fit in around it. But yeah, it's not meant to be a big, dense, mid-rangey kind of production. You want to let the vocal do its thing and, and make a nice atmosphere around it. Yeah, and definitely in the compositions that you guys have, it's uh, it would be more against you guys if you tried to do, to do like too much, you know, because you have to balance out like the production and uh, with like Ali's voice, such as, you know, like trip hop duos that like were out there like in the 90s like you know portisad tricky massive attack all those like people or even um uh, i'm trying to think of some other more atmospheric uh artists in the 90s uh apex twin like even those ty uh those type of people like you really can't be doing too much when it comes to just like the guitars and like the drums because when i hear also like the drums that you guys have on your albums 
I definitely get like a lot of like trip hop. So I like I draw a lot of comparisons to you guys and like massive attack drums from the nineties. It, it it all goes back to guys like um, you know uh, you know DJ Premier, Pete Rock, um, you know Jay Dilla, all guys that you know were, were were using a lot of sample drums. So all those great classic breaks from like you know the seventies, like James Brown records and stuff that everybody was like mining back in the day. Like that sound is so good. And I remember when I started getting into music production, I was really influenced by like DJ Shadow who built that introducing record totally from samples and that's a, an unbelievable sound when you do it so we're either always trying to find cool samples or trying to just make things that we record sound like samples they just it has a little more character i don't like when things are too clean or too kind of polished i like it almost to sound like it's it's sort of nostalgic in a way it sounds like a memory of something you heard not necessarily like something that's like just very shiny and new at this point, is it like trying to take something digital and make it sound analog? Is that yeah. fair, fair assessment? <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah. So we, yeah, we'd record drums and we'd run them out through old cassette decks, boom boxes. Uh, I have an old uh, analog Roland tape echo that I ran everything through just to get, you know, just to have it not be so like digital sounding because I think things can be a little too polished in, in the digital realm. You got to get some kind of vibe on it. So that's usually the way to do it. I wanted to say too about the 90s references like we started the this band like in 2012 or 13 recording I would say probably 13 when it was still like more of like folk revival like there was like you know Mumford and Sons was all big and like I don't, I don't know it was just like we and then now right now I'm walking around seeing how big the 90s are getting like every day I see a new example of like the mom jeans that are like all out of control so the 90s are coming back but I want to say that we that was not our intention was to do like a 90s throwback band or, or have that influence it was more like just those bands never I never stopped liking those bands you know like I never there was never like a, a time when I didn't listen to Portishead <laughs> yeah yeah I definitely feel that and with time, you can see the stuff that's aged well, like like uh, those Massive Attack records in the 90s. I still listen to those regularly. Mezzanine is incredible. I mean, even Blue Lines, their first one, and, um, you know, everything Portishead released. It, it, so it's something that it's like a lot of records from the 90s sound, kind, you know, they're dated now, some of them. But, you know, the, the, a lot of that, that kind of trip-hop stuff I, it, it's, it's still pretty classic. It still, yeah. to this day, sounds fresh. So, um, you know, a record like Mezzanine, you know, they could drop that this week, it would sound, you know, it would sound, I think it would sound current. I mean, it, it's just not, that never really stopped sounding good or, you know, contemporary. So it's, it's sort of like, you know, you can see what works and what doesn't after time has gone on. And just to go back even farther, like back into, you know, the whole mythos of like the whole startup of what would become Mexico City Blondes. Was it ever really, like, difficult, you know, getting your foot in the door and, like, getting just, like, people to, like, listen? Because, you know, when, like, you're first promoting your, like, tracks, people, like, if you come on too strong, people are just, like, going to be turned away, like, by whatever you're showing them. So was it ever, like, a time where it was, like, really difficult to just, like, find your footing in the door and to get your place, like, get your name out there, like, in the music scene? Yeah, I mean, I when when so we we recorded Fade, and then I I my the whole promotion for that song consisted of me basically emailing blogs that I followed, and I sent about thirty emails, and I got I only got two replies. One of them was thanks, but no thanks, and the other one was Hilly Dilly, who said we love it, we're gonna put it up, and that's all it took. As soon as they put it up, then it got a ton of pickup from it. it you just need that one kind of tastemaker that one person to just put a stamp on something you know it's it's kind of a shame but it's just sort of the way it's always been in the music industry you need somebody that's in there just to to say look at this listen to this this is cool and then all of a sudden everyone else kind of is like oh this is good yeah so it, it was because you, you feel like it's sort of daunting you just don't get any responses from people and then you know you get lucky but I mean who knows I mean I sent that email on a Friday afternoon or something and they re replied right back I mean if somebody it could have got lost in an inbox somewhere you know that maybe never got posted anywhere you know you just don't know but it's tough I feel for new bands that are trying to do it but you know I say just you know, just go after, like, figure out where you get your music from and then go through, try and get it into those channels, basically, and just 
do the best you can without being annoying. And it's always good to send a personal email. Don't, you know, mass mail anything. Keep it personal. Say, hey, man, you know, I like your blog. I like what you posted, blah, blah, blah. Try and engage people in a conversation or come at it from a short, friendly way as opposed to like, you know, all this hype and, you know, look at this, this is our bio, like blah, blah, blah. It's just, no, it, it turns people off immediately. So if you're, if you're approachable and friendly with people, they usually have a pretty good response. Obviously, like I read like some blogs about you just like to like refresh on this. And I'm just wondering, uh, Greg, and then I'll go to like Ali, like Greg, when are you going to like sell out and like do a record with uh, MC Hammer? Like, you know, cover it. <laughs> you can't touch this. <laughs> <laughs> we talk about it all the time <laughs> yeah i'm just wondering are you ever gonna like sell out i i don't think we could honestly you yeah, know it, it's it, i don't know because i'm not i'm not uh, like we're not good at we're not really good at faking it like it, you know and i'm not saying that like artists that are successful or pop fake it i mean there's generally a lot of talent and it's really difficult to write a good pop you know track but for the most part like Allie and I can only ever, I think, do well what it is we want to do. And we've been in situations where we've been in the room with like songwriters that were bigger producers and we kind of just shut down. I mean, we're just not really good at, at, um, at, at trying to do something that we're not fully invested in, in a way. So, I mean, I think it'd be amazing. I, I, I would, I would love to just, you know, be able to make, you know, a good living just doing music and stuff. But I think if, you know, Allie and I tried to, do a record with a bunch of collaborators that was real kind of shiny and big and polished. Like I, I don't, I don't know if it would sound good. And I think people might hear it and say, you know, this isn't really their thing and, and I'm not buying it. So yeah, we, we, it's, it's, it's tough. I, I don't, I don't know that selling out is that easy to do. If it was, I, <laughs> I think we'd be opposed to it maybe, but you know, we just like to try and make the music that we want to make and that we feel good about. I feel that. And Ali, I'm wondering, since I did read a blog about you, that your first CD that you ever bought was uh, No Doubt's uh, Tragic Kingdom, right? Sure, yeah, probably. So I'm wondering, uh, are you ever going to sell out and do a Gwen Stefani like collaboration and you know make another pop anthem like Holla Back Girl? Um, you know, it's hard to say. Like, I just try to stay true to the music, you know, and I do, I am open to, like, different phases. You know, like I said, I wouldn't be opposed to trying to write a song like Fade, but I think the reason Fade's good is that it, it, it I wrote it really, like, from my heart you know it really meant a lot to me when i wrote it so it's like yeah i'm down like you know i think gwen was probably in her 40s when she did that you know and i'm when i'm in a different stage of my life who knows you know i did i do um have visions of myself you know going like in different genre directions all the time you know and you just never know when that bug is gonna like bite you and you just have to make a a funk record or whatever you know i'm down i'm down to completely switch it up and and do something different but it'll be because it, i really want to you know it won't probably won't be contrived as far as like hmm, now i think would be a good time to to move into this direction it will just be because i'm really inspired and i'm feeling that way so definitely and, uh, yeah and, and i think pharrell produced that track we would we would work with pharrell <laughs> Pharrell? Yes, yeah, Pharrell he would be the dream girl. producer for that. Is that right? Yeah. I didn't know that. Was yeah, it was, it was either Pharrell by himself or uh, him, and his, him and his buddy when, you know, they did all the clip stuff and all that. But yeah, we, yeah, Pharrell, yeah, man, if you want <laughs> Shout out to your track, we're in it. <laughs> That's dope. And to talk about uh, Blush being on the charts, so I just want to put in perspective uh, how Blush is doing on the charts and... You guys, uh, this week are right now on the twenty-sixth spot on the NA double C charts, and I want to put this in perspective for you guys. So you guys are ahead of Mac DeMarco's uh, "Be the Cowboy" album. You guys are ahead of a uh, uh, the latest Courtney Barnett single. You guys are also ahead of Kevin Abstract from a hip hop group called Brockhampton, and yeah, you guys right. are ahead of uh, Silver Sun Pickup. So. How does that feel? Like, I mean, you right now, you guys are ahead of my two favorite uh, two favorite musicians from 2017. So, how does it feel like to be like, you know, just like ahead, like even in the charts, like from like starting like these humble beginnings to like now being on like the NAWC charts? Uh, yeah, yeah. Ali, uh, I mean, I it's it's awesome. I, I just I just like seeing you know we're just fans of music, so it's not really about the competition. You know, we just feel honored to, to, to just be anywhere near, you know, those names because we just, we love their albums, too. You know, we listen to all that. 
So it's 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 gratifying for sure. Um, it's just nice to to be in the mix with other artists that we respect and admire. And we did work really hard on this album, so it's it feels good to have people actually listen. So you know, it's just definitely we definitely tried our tried our best to make it what is a good uh, just to, to have a nice offering for our second album. It's just we really we we put a lot of a lot of effort and uh, genuinely ourselves into it. So it feels good just to have anybody listen. It's awesome. Yeah, that was good, and it's just like amazing. Uh, like it amazes me because you know, like starting up, like any band would be like would dream of like making it near like their favorite musicians like next on the chart so like does it ever go like dang like i'm next to like mac demarco's be the cowboy album uh, not be the cowboy here comes the cowboy i was getting that mixed up with a uh, yeah, yeah that was yeah. a great record too yeah great record yeah. but um uh or just like oh dang i'm next to the courtney barnett single or kevin abstract like do you guys ever like think of that like just like wow like we're on like yeah I really don't, you know, when it comes to, at the end of the day, like, it's like, it's great, but all those lists are so transient, like, they don't, I don't know, they're just so passing, and at the end of the day, we're still hauling our own gear at shows. Yeah. <laughs> we haul so much gear, like, I don't think we're that <laughs> big of a deal. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's funny, yeah, the, the juxtaposition, it, 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 it's, uh, it is sort of jarring, you're like, hey, look, the record's charting, but yeah, we... We just played a show this past week, and we're hauling all our shit. <laughs> so we would, we would, we wouldn't mind a lower chart position if if we had a road crew. <laughs> that would be the it's a, it's pretty amazing that like you guys are on, uh, you guys made it this a high in the charts, and all from uh, it all started from a Craigslist ad, right? Absolutely, yeah. No, it is. It blows your mind when you really think about when you really think about it. We just had really a lot, a lot of luck along the way. And we just, I, I think it's, yeah, it's just due to us being true to ourselves and not writing anything to pander, but also just having the right connections and the right help along the way was really, really great. Yeah, no, yeah, it's wild. Yeah, we obviously, yeah, we, we didn't really have very high expectations. We were just two people that got together and to make music because we loved it and we had similar influences. So everything else that's, that's come after that is, has just been really, you know, really gratifying and we're, we've been amazed by it and, you know, we're, we're happy to keep doing it. It gives us a reason to keep doing it, which is nice. That was good. And with the release of this album, where do you guys see yourself in the future for the next album or down the road in five years? Like, where do you guys see Mexico City Blondes? Uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll have a road crew. <laughs> a road crew. <laughs> it's really, really tour I think that's when we'll know we'll make it when we have like a full on like you know we don't have to we can just show up for sound check and then go back yeah. to the you know hotel or whatever. And yeah, I, I don't I don't mind the work. I mean, it's not I'm not complaining. It's more just like you know it keeps you real for sure. And oh. I'm down to, I'm down to like be my own roadie. And but it's just um, for me this the releasing blush has been an amazing experience. Um, we released. Our first um, set of songs. It, I have to admit, I was a. It was kind of a, a lot right at the same, like right all at once, and it was a little much. It was kind of stressful for me personally. So this um, album has been such a dream to release. Just having Burger on board has been so just fun to work with those guys, and they just keep it so real, um, you know. And it's just been a lot more of a down to earth, like just real, you know, quality release. So. It's been really fun and it motivates me to want to to write more music and get something out sooner this time because it's been so much fun to promote this album and we got to go to south by southwest for the first time and and uh just it, that was a definitely a bucket list experience so it just it drives you to want to just make more music and and get it out there so that we can do it all again and, and connect with our fans again so yeah yeah we, we've already started kind of talking about what what the next record might be is so it's interesting to to think about it now and it's sort of in its embryonic stage and then you know hopefully we can talk about it again in another year or two and be like whoa look, this is what it sounds like it's wild to think that there will be a whole other like kind of batch of songs and and it's it's crazy it's daunting but it, it'll be fun and hopefully i'll be talking to you about having a road crew as well for that album <laughs> yeah i mean nice. <laughs> or at That's least I, I don't know good. like rick rubin jump on board to produce your album or pharrell yeah, let's call him up, one if you can. I'll call them up. Uh, if I definitely have the connections, I would definitely call them up for you guys. <laughs> anything that you can say for the younger artists of like the generation, like anything that 
any words of wisdom that they can take to get a crack at the music scene? You really, these days, I think, in order to, to do anything, you, you, the old label's kind of gone. It used to be you formed a band, you played some shows, you maybe got some money from a label to go make a record, but it's totally the opposite. Now, I think to have any success, you really need to learn how to produce. You know, you need to learn how to record and kind of mix and, and put things together yourself. And there's so many good ways to do it. Um, you know, any of the DAWs, I use Logic Pro and Ableton, but you can use Pro Tools, you can use Cubase. A lot of people use Fruity Loops. Um, you know, learn learn one of the platforms, go on YouTube, learn as much as you can about how to produce and record your own tracks, and then just keep doing it, you know? Just make the kind of music you want. Don't try and anticipate what you think is going to be popular. Don't chase trends. Just put the kind of music in the world that you, you, want, there, it, you want to exist. And I, I think if you practice and you do it enough, well, eventually one of these days something is going to hit for you. But just keep at it. Every song you write, the next one will be a little better. The next mix will be a little better. The next recording will be a little better. And just keep doing it. And, uh, you know, do it because you love it. Don't chase any kind of money or, or fame just make the kind of music you want to make and hopefully that stuff comes to you and if you do it well and it should eventually and what about you ali any um anything you can say to the younger generation of artists yeah just a few things um so when i first started out uh kind of as a as an adult like writing songs and things like that i mean you are you did like you, it, does, it doesn't start out pretty you know you just almost have to like picture yourself in a couple of years and just keep on trucking because it's hours logged so just logging the hours of like getting better each time and not judging yourself for the first works that you do but also and then when you when you have something to put out you know that's what I think was part of the magic of the first release that we did was Greg just has a really great way of presenting the material in a really personable way. You know, I, I can't tell you how many like emails that we get that are just like template emails that I just delete, you know, and he has a really like strong voice, I think, in his like just personability and writing emails and just getting it out there and asking almost just like a friend I would ask for a favor, you know, just kind of, will you listen to my stuff, you know? Um, and then the third thing I would say is if you are really, you know, feeling your production, because it's so easy, not easy, but it's so um, accessible for people to make music at home. One mistake that we made, I think, or not mistake, but just in hindsight, we never really played the songs live. They were just like, they only existed in recording. So when we, when you know people started really liking fade we were like looking at each other like whoa like we've never even like we didn't even know how to play that song together live so you know just like knowing that like you can make something online that you know could really blow up and it's good to have uh, experience playing that song as a as a band <laughs> yeah we, yeah we had all these like show offers but we, we kept having to tell people that we don't we're not we no a band you know <laughs> They'd be like, hey, they want you to play here. They're going to give you this much money. Say, hey, we'd love to, but like, you know, we, have no, we don't even know how. So, yeah, it's wild. But, yeah, it might be good just to, just to rehearse a few live before you put it. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to say thank you very much, guys, for this interview. And, yeah, uh, great record. And I'm really hoping uh, that you guys go on tour soon and you guys just keep on expanding because I really do uh, enjoy your sound and your – aesthetic and just your uh, whole like do-it-yourself kind of like punk attitude that's like that's what i really uh, enjoy most about you guys because it's like uh, it's very interesting whenever uh, you get to know the artist and then you know what's actually going behind the scenes instead of just seeing like the whole front cover you know thank you man we appreciate that that really means a lot yeah thanks a lot it's really fun talking with you on yeah all right, well, I'll catch you guys later, and I hope to see you guys on the East Coast. Yeah. Us too. Sounds All like right. a plan. Okay. See you guys. Bye. You got a good mouth for talking, don't you? When you want to make me care for you, they always said I had good legs. Walking. But I